Emergency Response Planning for Livestock Operations. In this presentation, we'll focus on responding to two of livestock production's potential hazards, manure spills and catastrophic death. While nature, human error, or both may play a role, proper preparation and response can help reduce the impact to people and the environment. Producers, regulators, and emergency response agencies all have their own roles and responsibilities. We'll explain critical planning and response elements for each coming up, starting with manure spills. Why are manure spills a concern? While a great value as fertilizer for cropland, manure can also cause serious consequences for humans and the natural environment. If a spill reaches surface water, pathogens can create public health hazards, fish can be killed when their habitat is shocked by ammonia in manure, or suffocated when nutrients help pull oxygen out of the water. In recent years, Minnesota's seen its share of storage areas running over, broken fittings or other leaks in pumping equipment, and overturned tanks used to haul manure to the field. How much is spilled and where determines the level of action required from the farmer and agency staff in response. The following guidelines are a direct result of knowledge gained from these events. Four basic steps in any serious manure spill start with stopping the flow of manure or at least slowing its progress. Next, call the Minnesota duty officer. They'll alert the proper regulatory agency needed to respond. The third step is to clean the manure that's spilled as quickly and completely as possible. Last, a report that documents what happened and how it was handled is drawn up. Who's responsible for each step? Let's have a closer look. Stopping the flow of manure immediately should always be the highest priority. The farmer or manure hauler is responsible for getting started. This could be as simple as shutting off the pump when a hose breaks or parking a tractor wheel on the hose to stop the flow. If the spill is a result of an overturned manure tank, stopping the flow might require a makeshift dike or dam to stop manure from running into surface water. Immediately after that, the farmer or hauler must call the state duty officer. The duty officer will assess the situation and alert the appropriate agency or agencies. This almost always includes regional staff from the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. After that, the County Environmental Services Office or County Feedlot Officer should be called. The local sheriff, DNR, or PCA office is often contacted first by farmers or anonymous passers-by. Regardless, the state duty officer still needs to be notified. When county feedlot officers or PCA staff take a farmer's call after a spill, they should always ask if the duty officer's been notified. If not, staff should offer the number and encourage them to call immediately. For many spills, it's in the farmer or hauler's best interest to be the one who calls the duty officer first. In certain cases, not doing so might make an accidental spill appear deliberate. A quick call by staff to the county sheriff's office can confirm the duty officer's been notified, since every incident reported to them will be relayed by phone or fax to the local sheriff. If the call is from a passerby, staff should try to contact the farmer or hauler if known. If not, staff should call the duty officer themselves, then head out to the site. Once on site, responders must be aware of safety hazards such as confined space entry, flooding, surface water safety, slippery, steep, or unstable areas, and potential exposure to farm chemicals. Proper biosecurity measures and awareness of possible exposure to pathogens should be a priority. Responders should also find out if the farmer or manure applicator has an emergency response plan. If so, it will be tailored to their operation and have useful information to help in the situation. Agency staff should also have emergency response plans to help step through the process. Later on, we'll have details on what makes a good response plan and who should have one. 
For a manure spill, the ultimate responsibility for cleanup and repair of any damage goes to the farmer or manure applicator. Because every spill and its potential impact is unique, the action required will be based on the extent of damage. It's assumed the site will be restored to pre-spill conditions. This might include temporary dams, so contaminated water can be pumped from a stream or river. Soil saturated with manure may need to be scraped up and spread on a nearby field. MPCA and county staff are responsible for deciding what's required for cleanup and restoration. Such regulators should also help get additional resources to the site in cases where every second counts. This may include calling earth movers, pumpers, or tow trucks. Soil or water tests may be required to make sure there's little or no lasting impact. Each spill should be evaluated for potential human and environmental impacts. If a large amount of manures run into surface water, aquatic life can be killed by suffocation, ammonia content, rising or dropping pH levels, or any number of chemicals in the manure, including those from the farm that came along with the spill. This might include fuel that ran out of an overturned truck or tractor. Regarding public health, be mindful of pathogens or industrial chemicals reaching public recreation and drinking water. In this case, regulators should call the Minnesota DNR or Department of Health. Law enforcement should be called if cleanup requires traffic control or if evidence points to a deliberate discharge. Accidents happen, but any number of factors, including lack of adequate manure storage and available land, or lack of hauling and spreading equipment might drive a producer to just let a pit run over. Signs of criminal behavior include an unusual delay in reporting the incident. Evidence at the site can be in the form of dry manure upslope of the so-called spill and dry rings indicating much higher levels in the recent past where manure has ponded in low spots not designed for storage. Fresh earthwork around a storage area may also indicate an intentional release. However, such earthwork may also indicate quick, temporary repairs to a failed storage area. If criminal behavior is suspected, local law enforcement should be notified. Water sampling may be required with spills that have discharged to a lake stream or tile intake. Strict sampling protocol with proper collection containers, storage and transport methods, and a solid chain of custody record must be followed for all samples. If staff are not trained in proper sampling operation, contractors or vendors who specialize in such areas should be contacted immediately. Samples should be evaluated for physical, chemical, and biological parameters both up and downstream of the spill. Each of these criteria requires specific collection and handling protocols to assure an accurate representation of any spill's impact. As soon as possible, spilled manure and any contaminated soil or water should be land applied at agronomic rates. This requires some knowledge of the manure's nutrient content. If testing records are unavailable, spreading rates can be calculated or based on the pocket field guide to manure application. The Farmer's Emergency Response Plan should have drawings, maps, or a plat book showing land available for quick application, including locations of any tile inlets, culverts to drainage ditches, waterways, and any other sensitive features. If soil test records are not available, manure should be spread based on its phosphorus content. Once cleanup is complete, the responsible government staff should create a report of the incident. Any farmer or manure applicator on site at the time of the spill and during cleanup should be available to provide any necessary information. Starting with date, time, and location, a comprehensive report will also show where the manure was stored, how much was spilled, and where it went. Those responsible for the report should include any notes or documentation from before, during, and after the spill. This can be copies of recent manure and soil tests, water sampling results, and any other agency reports or photos. Be sure to note individuals or contractors who helped with cleanup efforts and any other agencies involved. If available, don't forget relevant background data, such as basic compliance inspection results, permitting, and any record of past violations and how they were handled. Accuracy of the report is critical. Stick to the facts. This helps avoid future problems 
and holds accountable those responsible for potential violations or enforcement actions. Another potential emergency on the farm is catastrophic death loss. This is when large numbers of livestock die at once. Such loss often can't be handled with a trip to the dead shed or compost bin. Common causes include fire, flood, extended loss of power, heat waves, or disease outbreaks. Catastrophic death loss can pose a serious risk to the environment, to humans, and even livestock on nearby farms. In many cases where large numbers of animals are dead, a fast response is critical to help reduce potential public health threats or threats to the environment. Quick and proper carcass disposal, handled in an orderly manner by trained authorities, can be key to keeping damage and disease from spreading beyond the farm. Once on site for a catastrophic death loss, begin by making sure the appropriate agencies have been notified. Carefully evaluate the site for disposal options with the farmer and other agency staff. Check with the farmer to see if an emergency response plan for death loss has been developed. If so, use the plan as a starting point for your response. Work with the farmer and other agency staff to develop and carry out the disposal plan quickly without losing sight of water quality concerns or biosecurity. The nature of such loss may require a team response from several agencies. Any evidence of disease in large numbers of dead livestock should be immediately relayed to the Board of Animal Health. In the case of an outbreak, they'll be the agency handling all cleanup and carcass disposal. Any cause other than disease will likely include the Board of Animal Health, but cleanup and disposal might be led by staff from the MPCA, DNR, local law enforcement, or the county's feedlot officer contractors and neighbors may also take part. Options for disposal are usually specific to the site and situation. Producer groups may have guidance for certain livestock, but any disposal plans should be worked out with agency staff to find the best option for the problem at hand. If possible, the least expensive route is to bury or compost on site other disposal options, such as burning, rendering, or a trip to a certified landfill, tend to be more expensive. Be aware, most insurance companies will pay to replace lost livestock, but will not cover dead animal disposal costs. On-site disposal is not only cheaper, in some cases, it can keep the cause of death from being hauled across the countryside but a decaying animal will release a lot of liquid. With that, burial or composting may not work near lakes and streams, tile lines, or where the water table is close to the surface. If the farm has a mound or at-grade septic system, it's a good indication that burial is not an option. For burial to be an option, current regulations require five feet of vertical separation between the dead animals and seasonal high water table. To avoid oversaturation of the soils, animals should be placed in a single layer. To avoid rodent problems or odor issues, at least three feet of soil is required for cover. If seasonal high water tables are less than eight feet deep, the bottom of the burial trench must be set higher, with the top cover mounted above the ground surface. If the water table is at least five feet down and the ground is level, mortalities can be set in a single layer on the surface, provided enough soils available for cover. It's important that the soil cover extends three to five feet beyond the carcasses on all sides. This way, liquid can move through the soil profile and not seep out the edge of the pile. Typical minimum setbacks for manure storage also apply to dead animal disposal. That's 300 feet from surface waters, 1,000 feet from drinking water supply management areas, and 100 feet from private wells. Avoid disposal in floodplain if possible. Again, areas with tile lines or open tile intakes will likely not work. Bear in mind you'll need about 20 square feet of space for every thousand pounds of dead livestock. Composting mortalities may be a more viable option than burial for a couple reasons. 
it can require less area and be done where the water table is at least three feet below the ground surface. Composting will require a large amount of biomass added to the mix as a carbon source. Sawdust, wood shavings, and litter are preferred due to their sponge-like ability to hold moisture. Other organic materials such as hay or corn stalks will work, but they'll absorb less. This may require more maintenance, or at least a closer eye kept on the pile to assure no leachate runs off. With any carbon source, smaller, less dense parts mean more surface area to hold moisture. Figure on about 100 cubic feet of biomass for every thousand pounds of carcass. That's usually a pound for pound amount, or a thousand pounds of bulking material per thousand pounds of dead weight. In most cases, two feet of biomass is needed for the base, after which a single layer of carcasses are placed and another two feet of biomass to top it off. Smaller animals like poultry can compost quite well with alternating layers of biomass a foot thick between each layer of carcasses. It doesn't matter if the compost piles inside or outdoors. What does matter is the pile's internal temperature. It should reach 130 degrees Fahrenheit or more for several days. Such heat will effectively break down carcasses and destroy most pathogens. It's also a good indication the pile's got the right mix of carcass, biomass, and moisture. Documentation of temperature readings helps monitor the process. The pile should also be turned or mixed after six to eight weeks to make sure all carcasses have been sufficiently degraded. If fire or severe weather is to blame for massive death loss, a lot of other debris is likely to be mixed with the dead animals. Legal disposal would require an on-site demolition permit issued by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency Solid Waste Division. What's exactly in the mix on-site will determine the proper course of action. Staff are required to document the incident and cleanup. Be sure to note the date and time of the event and all the agencies and contractors involved. Outline the disposal options discussed and final disposal method that's been approved. Include any pictures, video, or notes taken during the response and disposal process. For at least the next 30 days, be sure to return to the disposal site so leachate and other potential problems can be kept in check and documented. The frequency of return visits will depend on the type of disposal and the location. If appropriate, include a site map with the disposal area clearly marked. If soil samples were taken, include the results. Learn from the experience by noting what did and didn't work during and after the disposal operation. What's in an emergency response plan? Farmers, manure applicators, and agencies should all develop emergency response plans specific to their business, job responsibilities, and geographic location. Many components will be the same for all parties. Templates to help develop a plan can be found online at the address below. Let's look at what a plan should include. All plans should start with a list of contacts for the local and state agency staff that may need to be part of the response team. Include numbers for the Minnesota duty officer, county feedlot officer, county sheriff, county health department, area MPCA staff, and others who might be involved. The list should also have area labs or agency staff trained or certified to conduct proper water and soil sampling. Don't forget local excavators, manure applicators, and field tile contractors, and any others who may have access to needed equipment. Include local sources or vendors of bulking material for composting or soaking up spills. Include maps of the area, USGS topography quads, aerial photos, and plat books. All this ensures the right people can be contacted quickly if there's a possibility they'll be impacted. Maps should also show surface waters, public wells, soil types, slopes, and depth to the area's seasonal high water table. This information can be found online at the addresses below. Emergency response plans for farmers should include more detailed maps of the farm site, including current or sealed well locations, tile lines, tile intakes, buildings, manure storage areas, gates and fences, 
potential burial sites, and land available for legal manure application regardless of time of year. Location of areas where debris is known to be buried should also be noted, along with any past documented soil borings. Names and phone numbers of nearby landowners, including any information of wells in the neighborhood, is also useful on these maps. Like those drawn up by agency staff, emergency response plans for manure applicators will be more generalized, but they'll also have more detail on specific company procedures for dealing with spills. This might include a list of call numbers within the company. Also important is information specific to the hauler's equipment and machinery, such as locations of valves or where and how to turn off pumps as quickly as possible. Response plans for farmers and manure applicators might also include provisions for avoiding and preventing spills. Farmers may want to consider where manure will run if a valve, pump, or hose should fail. Manure applicators might include standard procedures such as regular equipment maintenance, road speeds, placement of drag hoses, and a protocol for when, where, and how often all equipment should be monitored while on the job. Agency plans should include a list of items to bring to the site such as boots, rubber gloves, camera, measuring tape, notebook or clipboard, area maps, feedlot files, cell phone, and the list of contacts outlined earlier. Include the location of where this equipment is stored to save time when it might matter most. Any farm or manure applicator's emergency response plan should be kept where it can be found by someone other than the property owner or site manager. For agencies, the plan should be easily located by all staff. All plans should be evaluated and updated once a year. Proper preparation can be the difference between a note stuffed in a folder and a nationwide news story. This preparedness comes with the development of an emergency response plan. Farmers, manure applicators, and agency staff should all develop and maintain current plans. While they'll look very different between each farm, responding agency, and both from region to region across the state, all emergency response plans should be done now. With a plan in hand, it's easier to handle emergencies if and when they occur. And when they occur, keep calm, stay safe, communicate well, and document all activity. For more information on emergency response planning or to have a look at examples, check out these websites. Remember, there's nothing wrong with hoping for the best as long as you're prepared for the worst. Thank you for looking in.